Okay, and now it's broadcasting to everyone. I'm just going to make sure it's also started on this login. Just start. Okay. Okay. Great. Aha, right. Yeah, participants are filing in now. Okay, just give everyone a second to connect to audio. Yeah, and I'm going to quickly grab a Diet Coke from the fridge as well before I forget. Sure, go for it. <laughs> okay, so I think we'll kick off. So hello and welcome to the joint Young Fabians and Fabian International Policy Group event tonight. We are branches of the Fabian Society, a think tank on the centre left, which facilitates member debate and activism across the UK and engages in policy at all levels to positively influence political decision making. We're delighted to welcome Wes Streeting, MP for Ilford North and Shadow Exchequer Secretary to the Treasury, who recently published a brilliant pamphlet with us actually called Let Us Face the Future Again. The crisis has forced us all to stop and think, evaluate and reflect about everything from our relationships to our careers, to the institutions and ideologies that underpin our society. And many have said we deserve better. So tonight we will take that forward thinking mentality and address some of the key questions we face in and beyond this crisis, for which I'll leave you in our chair, Retta's capable hands to introduce. Yes, thank you ever so much, Cecilia, for putting in great work as always to organize these events. Uh, I don't really believe our speaker needs much in the way of introduction, but I will just provide a quick brief of what we're really looking at. We're looking at, we're talking COVID-19, we're talking environment, we're talking about uh, how we can move the world forward after we overcome the particular challenges that COVID-19 has presented itself with. And we'll talk about a little bit more broadly about politics and policy and just have a really lovely general overview. So I guess we'll just jump straight into it. Uh, and the first question that I have for you, Wes, is, you know, obviously we wouldn't be able to talk about 2020 without making reference to COVID-19. I'm really interested just to hear from you from the outset what you really think the lasting legacy would be, as in what do you think we'll remember in 10 or 20 years time about this event in political terms? I, I think that's firstly good evening everyone and um, thanks for tuning in and uh, if this is a welcome break after a whole day of doing line by line scrutiny of the finance bill it's nice to be sort of back in the big picture rather than the weeds of, of um, fiscal measures and um, taxes that no one's ever heard of, um, which I'll probably touch on a little bit with some of the themes in terms of the lack of government ambition at the moment on some, some really big issues. Um, firstly on COVID-19, I mean, I think that's a really good question. Um, you know, sort of how, how will we look back on this in, you know, sort of a decade or, or two's time? I think that's partly, um, you know, sort of beyond the obvious and the sort of the nostalgia and, you know, do you remember what it was like having to queue for Tesco and, you know, when we couldn't go to work and, and all the rest of it? Um, I, I think there are a whole series of choices that we can make now that will shape the kind of future that our country has. And I think this has the potential to be a moment, um, almost like the aftermath of the Second World War, where Britain emerged from a crisis and if we get our political choices right, can emerge stronger. I mean, uh, when we first hit the rocks with coronavirus and it became clear how serious the public health crisis was and what the economic fallout would be, I, I think there were some immediate um, sort of issues that were thrown up, which won't necessarily be a huge surprise to Labour Party members, but I think has come as a surprise to um, some sections of the public. Um, first of all, it's quite clear that the state, um, in lots of respects, lacked the resilience to insulate our society against some of the worst effects of the coronavirus. So the fact that we have failed over the last decade to 
tackle the crisis in social care means that older and more vulnerable people have been more exposed to the coronavirus, more dangerously exposed to the coronavirus than they would otherwise have been. Uh, the you know, the sort of our public services after sort of a decade of cuts and austerity, I think have found it um, a lot more difficult to sort of manage resources and some of the, you know, I think there's a fine line sometimes between waste and inefficiency and um, building in natural resilience and capacity. And I, I hope that one of, one of the things that comes out of this crisis is that we start to ask some harder questions about resilience. Um, and that also plays directly into the social security system, or as I keep on describing it, the social insecurity system. When people first started contemplating that they might lose their jobs or their income overnight, millions of people logged on to the government website to look at what they would be entitled to. And, and, and many of those people would have been looking at the benefit system possibly for the first time in their lives and you know, in, their, in, their fa in their family's recent history at least. And I think lots of people were shocked actually by the grim reality of our social insecurity system. And, you know, that astonishing admission from the health secretary on BBC Question Time that he couldn't afford to live on statutory sick pay of 94 pounds a week, but that's what we expect other people to do. Um, and interestingly, when you look at the international comparison as well, the fact that other countries um, were able to um, take an unprecedented crisis like coronavirus, but make adjustments to existing systems for social protections and income protections, making them more generous or expanding their scope far more easily than the government. And, you know, to, to, to be fair to the government and recognising what they've done in terms of the um, self-employment income support scheme, which we had to drag them to, by the way, um, the job retention scheme, the furloughing stuff. I mean, this, this is, you know, unprecedented, totally unexpected from a Conservative government and a Conservative Chancellor. But the point is that Rishi Sunak's big dilemma was how to get money into people's pockets fast uh, because there, was, there were no systems set up and HMRC has been designing systems from scratch. And I think we should be thinking a lot more carefully and wisely as a society about how it is that we create genuine safety nets. So, um, you know, so I think that's one big, big part of it is about sort of the resilience of our public services, the role of the state and whether coming out of this crisis, we become a more kinder society um, where solidarity and reciprocity matters. Even if that, you know, that's the language of the left, it might not be, uh, you know, I don't expect um, when the pubs open um, over the coming months that people are going to be down the Fairlop Oak up the road from me and talking about reciprocity and social solidarity. But I think people might be thinking a bit more about how we look after each other and the way in which our society is sort of um, sort of coming through this. There's, there's all of this kind of social, you know, social security and sort of economic injustice side of things. Um, you know, and that's before we get on to thinking about the levels of structural, structural unemployment we're likely to see as a result of the recession we're living through. And I think m many of the choices now rest on, um, you know, the, the kind of action the government takes to make sure this recession is as short and shallow as possible. Um, so, so I think that there's, there's that kind of side of things. I think there's also a broader question, thinking about some of the big challenges that are coming down the track, um, issues like um, climate change. You know, we declared a climate emergency in this country. Parliament has declared a climate emergency. But I think in response to COVID-19, which is a public health emergency, we've seen what an emergency response looks like. We've seen the way in which the, the focus, the resources, the policy initiatives of the state, um, working in tandem with others, have been sort of marshaled together to tackle this emergency situation. I don't think what we have seen from the government so far in response to the threat of catastrophic climate breakdown could possibly be described as emergency response. And in fact, in the Finance Bill Committee today, um, I got my, as, as the shadow minister in the Treasury team responsible for climate change, um, I was getting my teeth into that big burning issue of how we tackle climate change, the issue of car tax and how levies are applied to certain vehicles, depending on how old they are and how, how much carbon they, they emit. And uh, the point I made this afternoon was, you know, if, if this is the extent of the ambition of the finance bill in relation to tackling climate change, we've got a lot more work to do. So I hope when we think about the, the disruptive impact that, that a virus has had on our lives and think about how we respond to that, that we'll start thinking about the crises um, that are coming fast down the track now and start thinking about some of the responses to that too. Um, 
I guess the, the final thing I'd just say, so I'm, I, I promise not to answer every question um, as lengthily as this. I want to let, allow plenty of time for discussion. And I'm genuinely interested in what other people think. Um, but the final thing I'd say is about the sorts of economic choices that lie ahead. And obviously the consequence of the last general election is that we are not making those choices. We're trying to pressure and influence um, the government. But I think there's a, there's a fascinating question about what kind of conservative government we have and what kind of choices they'll be making. It could be that um, the, the government uh, takes a sort of George Osborne, Sajid Javid sort of classic conservative Cam or, you know, Cameroonian uh, view and respond to this crisis in the way that they did to austerity, which is, you know, nation needs to tighten its belt. We're going to have a round of public spending cuts. We're going to have to cut corporation tax and taxes for um, well-off people because we want to stimulate the economy, but we're going to cut public services for everyone else. Well, we know how that story ends and the country can't afford another decade, another lost decade to austerity. So, you know, it'd be interesting whether to see whether that happens. But, uh, you know, I, I keep on calling this government a, a vote leave government rather than a conservative government. When you look at Boris Johnson and the personalities around him in number 10, notoriously Dominic Cummings, um, they don't strike me as being traditional conservatives. You know, Boris Johnson as mayor of London, aside from being fairly useless, um, in terms of lots of the statements that he made and, and the positions and the poses and the postures he adopted weren't what I would describe traditional Tory postures. So Boris Johnson can be a bit of a chameleon and he's quite adaptable and flexible, um, but he's surrounded by a group of ideologues that I would describe and characterise as sort of right-wing populists or libertarian populists in some respects. So it would be interesting to see whether he means it, means it when he says he doesn't want to talk about the A word and whether the levelling up agenda and the investment in infrastructure and all the rest of it, particularly in those red wall seats, um, comes to pass. And, and that will do a lot, I think, to um, make the political weather in this parliament, because one of the frustrations of being in opposition is that government often sets the questions and sets the, in terms of parliament, um, often literally sets the terms for the debate. So we're going to have to think about how we respond to the government. Um, uh, and then that will determine sort of the path towards the next general election and what kind of opponents we're facing and whether we can make this, uh, you know, this, this, you know, the, 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 the march back to power under Keir Starmer, uh, a project that's achievable by the next general election, something that actually I'm, um, I'm feeling more confident and optimistic about than I have done for a long time. Uh, yeah, perfect. I mean, I think a lot of people in the webinar share that optimism i think it's been a really good start i did want to just pick up a little bit about this point of making the weather which i'm really interested in because it almost seems as if the government has lost an element of that agenda setting power it seems to me that the question is less should we spend government money a more a case of where we should spend it which isn't really the conservatives comfort zone especially the conservatives since the 1980s. I'm interested to see whether your experiences, I do want to most, mostly focus on Labour, but I am interested from your cons experiences as a member of parliament. Do you see Conservative MPs slowly shifting their approach to mirror the leadership or do you think there still is that broad sense of small state as first option? Namely, do you think there's any uh, ideological shift amongst the backbenchers of the Conservative Party on this issue? Uh, that's and again that's a really interesting question I, I can definitely see the discomfort um, among some of the conservative MPs that um, either I've gotten to know in my first five years as an MP since 2015 or I know of because some of them are notorious with careers stretching back through the um, major and Thatcher governments um, you know some of the classic fiscal conservatives are not comfortable in this space they they recognize um that the chancellor had to do what he's had to do um and it was interesting that you know i never thought i would see the day not just when a conservative chancellor would you know pay people's wages as directly as as as, as rishi sunak has but i'd never thought i'd see the day when john redwood um would stand up and and talk about the importance of, of the state intervening the way that it has it's um it's just been quite remarkable, uh, aside from anything else. Um, the new generation of Conservative MPs are a different bunch, and I don't think we've seen enough of them yet to get a sense of exact, precisely who they are. Um, it's always the case that um, I think new MPs, particularly um, after an election like the one we've had 
Uh, many of whom will feel they owe their seats to Boris Johnson and Dominic Cummings' political strategy. Many of whom will be ambitious and they will want to climb the greasy pole. Um, you know, it'd be interesting to see what kind of, um, what kind of tone they, they adopt. But I, I don't think it's a stretch of the imagination to believe that, you know, if you've just been elected in a seat like Bishop Auckland, um, home to famous um, Barnard Castle, which um, I'm sure we will all be visiting um, once it's all over or if we need an eye test. Um, you know, if you're in a seat like that, which has been a traditionally Labour seat or Sedgefield, um, solidly Labour seat, you know, you are not going to uh, be particularly enthusiastic about the prospect of there being another round of austerity and public service spending cuts because, you know, our Labour voters who switched to the Conservatives at the last election for all sorts of reasons that we've debated since the election should always keep on our on our minds in terms of thinking about how we win the next one. Um, you know, they're, they're, they're not they're not sort of small state, um, you know, advocates for cuts. Many of those people rely on public services and they won't be very impressed if if a Conservative government and their local Conservative MPs um, are, are delivering cuts for their services. So I think that is going to have a big impact on the, the sort of the politics and the economics of the government. Yeah. Uh, so the thing that I want to follow, which comes up straight away, is let's just take a hypothetical scenario. Uh, let's, let's assume that the Conservatives broadly behave in the way that we would expect them to. They spend for a period of time and then feel like they have to rein it in, which seems to be the prevailing sentiment. For those people who switch from Labour to Conservatives uh, in terms of their voting pattern, do you not think the more likely outcome is potentially they stop engaging with parliamentary politics altogether? Or do you think there is something that we can be doing to draw them back? Well, for a start, I mean, we, we should not give up on these people. Um, I've been frustrated, uh, you know, in sort of recent years that uh, sort of people have been, um, you, you know, sort of uh, reluctant. And it's not, it's not just a sort of phenomenon of, of the last five years. We have had a problem uh, over, uh, I think the last decade, a uh, discomfort in the Labour Party with talking about Tory switches and switching mm -hmm. people who voted Conservative back to Labour as if there's some kind of heresy involved or some kind of outrageous compromise or sellout in persuading people who voted Conservative to vote Labour. That's how we win elections. That's how I won my seat in 2015, which very much bucked the trend on a terrible night for Labour, um, overturning a five and a half thousand Tory majority and turning it into a, into a Labour gain, um, one of only 10 that night. Um, so, so let's not give up on them. I think there are obviously some uh, features of the last election campaign which won't feature at the next one, we hope. Um, some of the challenges around leadership, some of the baggage of the manifesto and the Brexit dimension, um, which may not have been the biggest problem for us, but undoubtedly was a factor. Um, I think there's a, a question about whether the loss of those voters has as much to do with their sort of cultural analysis of where Labour is now and whether or not they just kind of feel like we're their sort of party and, and, and fit with them. Uh, and that might lead, um, you know, lead us into all sorts of cul-de-sacs if we could make some of those calls wrong. But, um, you know, I, I've, not, I've not given up on those people. I don't get the sense that Keir Starmer's has given up on them. He's been doing all sorts of call Keir events in, in place, you know, he's just doing one in Wolverhampton. Today I saw where we, we lost two seats at the last general election in the black country, you know, this is kind of like Labour heartland territory. So I'm glad that he's out there engaging. I think for those voters and for lots of others too, I think one of the common problems that Labour has at election time is that people often assume that our heart's in the right place. They just need some reassurance that our head is in the right place too. And at the last election, I think voters not only questioned whether our head was in the right place and whether our policies were realistic or achievable or would be delivered um, or whether or not we could be trusted to sort of keep the country safe on things like national security. I think there was also sort of questions about political culture and, um, you know, the sort of the, I don't, I think anti-Semitism was a, was a bigger issue for the Labour Party beyond constituencies like mine with significant Jewish populations. I think people were looking in and thinking, this does not look like the Labour Party that we know. We did not expect the Labour Party to be engulfed in a row about racism. This is not what, this is not what we think you lot are about. 
So I think they were questioning whether our heart was in the right place too. So we've got to fix our culture, make sure that in the next election, we've got a manifesto that people can believe in um, and uh, make sure that, you know, in terms of our campaigning activity and campaigning culture, that we're out there listening, genuinely listening, engaging and, and making sure that people in seats that, um, that we lost at the last election realise that we've got the message, um, we want to win back their trust and that's what we're working hard to do to earn their trust. Do you think a large element of winning back that trust relies on the Labour Party rediscovering its ability to win those conversations in a compassionate way? I remember a few people remarking to me beforehand who didn't vote Labour at the last general election saying, I'm not quite sure, but something feels off about the tone in which Labour discusses policies. Do you think that there's, a, there's an element of we didn't actually manage to communicate what were often quite good ideas? And what do you think we should be doing as an activist base, you know, the people who are listening into this webinar, in order to embrace that sort of conversational attitude? And as you say, that idea that we shouldn't judge people who have voted Conservative in the past because often they've had very real concerns which have driven them to do so. Yeah, that's right. Um, yeah, I mean, so where to start on, the, on this point about language? I, I, I honestly feel that sometimes we are just having a completely different conversation to the voters and, and talking about policies in a way that no normal people outside of the political bubble do. And, you know, that's, that's all right sometimes. Um, and, you know, it's, it, it's, 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 it's kind of fine in sort of labour circles to sort of have a sort of really sort of meaty sort of policy heavy discussion to sort of, you know, have sort of, you know, you know sort of think about your sort of policies in the context of, you know, our ideological inheritance over generations um, of sort of political thought. Um, but I, you so rarely have those sorts of conversations on the doorstep. And I often hear it said in defence of the last manifesto and the, and the one before in particular, um, but particularly the last election. But our policies were so popular. We've polled them all and they're all popular. Everyone loved our policies. They just didn't vote for them. And I, I think there are two problems. Um, one is people don't judge a party just on um, individual policies. They, they, they look at the sort of the coherence of your whole program, your worldview, your leadership, um, you know, the, the face you're presenting to the country. And so it, it might be that individually they liked all of our policies. That doesn't mean that they um, believed in the manifesto as the, uh, and, and, and the leadership team as the sort of the combined offer to the country. And that was definitely reflected in, in the evidence we've heard from so many pollsters and from um, and sort of focus groups, but also, you know, the thing that always grounds me, which is just knocking on doors and talking to people, um, is that people thought our policies were popular, but the moment they were told that they were Labour's policies, the popularity fell significantly. So there's a kind of gap there of trust and credibility. And one of the, one of the challenges I think we've got in the Labour Party at the moment is that unless we put the word radical in front of something um, and we want to be really bold, we want to be really big and really radical, we want to change loads of stuff. I totally understand why. I mean, you know, I joined the Labour Party because I wanted to change the country and change the world. Um, so I, I, I totally get that. But uh, the word radical could be frightening to lots of people. Um, and people don't always want radical change. They want change they can believe in. I mean, it's, it's interesting when you look back at the 1997 general election, what's striking about those, you know, that little pledge card with the five pledges on that we had in the 97 general election wasn't that it was so ambitious, but actually that the pledges were so practical and simple and easy to understand and seemed quite modest in their ambition. You know, we'll cut class sizes for five, six and seven year olds. Um, you know, we had a pledge on doctors and nurses and on the number of police officers. Um, and, you know, there were a lot, lots of that stuff was in the last manifesto, but it was just buried under this mountain of stuff. And, um, and so I think you've just got to think about how you articulate policies in a way that really connects with people and their lives 
and their experiences and their priorities and use them to paint a picture about the kind of country you're going to create. And don't pretend that you can deliver, you know, a generational um, paradigm shifts um, in the space of a single parliament. I mean, that's part of the challenge. I think, you know, whether, whether members are sort of people who are massive fans of Jeremy Corbyn and voted twice for him in the leadership election or people who are very critical of Jeremy Corbyn, I do think that the, the one big area of consensus about what, what went wrong at the last couple of elections is that, you know, the manifestos crammed too much in and there wasn't a story. I mean, we were announcing policies during the general election that I'd never even heard debated or discussed and I've been kind of following stuff quite closely. So why were we surprised that the public didn't think, oh, that's a good idea. We didn't spend any time laying the groundwork and explaining things. So, um, you know, so don't mistake what I've said for um, a lack of ambition or a sort of complacency about the state of our country. There, there are so many things that make my blood boil every week when I look at my casework and when I go into work in Parliament that I really want to change. But one of the things that makes my blood boil more than anything else is the futility of opposition. And like today with the finance bill, I, I went into work this morning thinking about what I was going to say. No doubt Jesse Norman and Kemi Badenoch and the, the Tories who went in were thinking, oh, how am I going to get through this committee? Because I've got loads of stuff to do. And that's, that's, the, that's the thing that is just driving me uh, all the time at the moment is just how do we get to that next general election and make sure we've got a Labour government and I think that is about changing our language our tone our approach our conversations so that you know by all means let's have some really good really detailed policy conversations within the Labour family and the Labour movement but then let's think about how we translate them out to the public and make sure that our priorities re you know reflect their priorities otherwise we don't get their permission to do anything at all. Yeah, 100%. And it's also what you were saying about the wanting to achieve too much too quickly directly correlates to what you said earlier about credibility, it seems. If you try to do too much too quickly, people automatically respond and say, this is not feasible. We haven't taken the preparatory steps in order to do so. And it did seem that we almost went for a manifesto that was too big, uh, too bold, uh, and so it became a very difficult sell. And this actually comes on to the first of our, we've, we've had a few Q&A questions. And I will just ask one for now because it's directly linked to this, which is what were the major changes to the next manifesto that uh, you, West Street MP, would like to see in order to win back the trust of people? What do, do you think there was a particular area that was under addressed or a modest policy that you'd have liked to have seen more of to show that we were championing championing everyone's interests? Yeah, it's a really good question. I mean, I think overall, I'd, I'd like the next manifesto to have a clearer sense of kind of priorities and, you know, what it is that we're trying to do for the country so that people, when they think about the Labour Party and, and what, it's, what it's going to do, they sort of have sort of four or five really key things that really speak to their lives and experiences and that they want to do. I mean, in my um, Fabian pamphlet that was that was referenced earlier, which I have a copy to hand, Let Us Face the Future Again, available in all good Fabian mail outs or um, for download on the internet if you have a particular um, bad case of insomnia. Um, you know, what, what I kind of set out in there was, um, you know, one of my criticisms of the last manifesto, actually, is that it wasn't progressive enough when you, you know, I, I'm a, uh, having been on the Treasury Committee for the last five years in the House of Commons, I've spent a lot of time... Um, arguing with governments to publish analysis of the distributional impact of their tax and spending measures. So looking at, you know, whether the wealthiest or the poorest um, are helped or hindered by the tax and spending measures in, in, in a particular budget. And I honestly think if you ran a distribution one out, I mean, IFS did a bit of this, but not to the depth that I'd, I'd have liked them to. But if you run a distributional analysis alongside our manifestos, um, I don't I don't think they were progressive enough and in fact in the last believe it or not in the last manifesto in 2019 the Liberal Democrats went into the election with a manifesto that was more generous and more progressive on welfare than the Labour Party was and if you think about the sort of the circumstances that swept Jeremy Corbyn into leadership and the abstention on the welfare bill back in 2015 um, I, I just thought that was quite remarkable on on, on, on many levels actually um, so a clearer sense of, uh, of, of, of priorities um, uh, and, and choices. I mean, that's the other thing I'd just say. Um, I've, I've done a few events with members recently. And I think this is a really important point to get, get across because 
a big part of our work on the shadow tre treasury team and the responsibility I think that um, we feel weighs really heavily on our shoulders is about rebuilding Labour's ec economic credibility. Now part of the challenge with that is I think um, some, some party members when they hear MPs and particularly um, frankly MPs like me who've been critical of the leadership in the last five years talk about economic credibility there's a shiver that runs down their spine and they think oh my goodness they're going to embrace Tory cuts god they've put a dreadful right-wing Blairite we're streeting in the treasury team he's probably going through the budget and thinking about which public service wants to cut uh, it, it, it just it really really drives me up the wall to be honest because I was in local government before I got elected to parliament and you know I was having to contend firsthand with Tory cuts and um, thanks, Mark, because I appreciate that. Uh, you know, having to deal with Tory cuts, so I have no appetite for wanting to champion them or support them. I don't think that's what it's about at all, actually. And, and as I said earlier, in terms of, you know, the, the essay question of economic credibility, I don't believe that austerity politics are credible politics. And I don't believe that the credible response to what we're living through now is to cut people's public services. Um, but it is about choices and it is about saying that Labour's got some clear priorities and this is why we've chosen our priorities and, and this is what we hope to do and, and winning people's trust. I think for me, that's what it's about. And, um, you know, uh, I think people have already seen reported Bridget Phillipson is keeping a close eye as Shadow Chief Secretary on our spending commitments. So I probably can't say too much else about what I'd like to have the next manifesto, except to say, I mean, if there's one overriding, and, it, and this, sort of, this is about my sort of personal um, personal bias I think and the things that motivated me to get involved in politics in the first place and my own upbringing um, you know as a kid the thing that I most want the next Labour manifesto to address is child poverty um, we've just seen some new figures out about rising child poverty in this country and uh, I think um, and fear that as a result of this recession child poverty will be even worse um, you know by, by the time there's a there's a Labour government and I want I, I just don't think there's an excuse for it I don't think in a country as wealthy as ours that there is any excuse for any child in this country to grow up in poverty um, or hunger and the thing that um, uh, has affected me is probably emotionally more than anything else um, in my casework in the last sort of five years or so is meeting kids who are growing up today in, in from backgrounds like mine sort of single parent parents reliant on the benefit system um you know they're growing up in worse circumstances now than i grew up in the 1980s you know i had a councillor flat a flat that was pretty crap and not a nice place to live and you know i'd be too embarrassed to bring my mates home from from school to play because it was just not a nice place to live but my god i just feel i was so lucky now looking back on it you know the the security of tenure the, the roof over the head the fact that you know we me and my mum and family we weren't moved from pillar to post and moving from school to school because we we're living in temporary bed and breakfast accommodation and being moved from here there and everywhere you know th things are worse now than they were in the 1980s that's not how things should be we should not be moving backwards so my, my the thing i'd like to see more than anything else in the next manifesto is a clear plan to eradicate child poverty in this country I honestly don't have anything to add to a really impassioned response on that topic. Although one of the things which I got quite a lucky break on when I was writing these questions is one of the things which really got to me was the lack of bold transport policies as well contained within some aspects of manifestos, not just in the United Kingdom, but across continental Europe. Uh, and so, and obviously in, in Prime Minister's questions and in, and in a number of other spaces, you've talked about the future of the aviation industry. And so I just wanted to pose whether you thought that there would be a future in the potential renationalization of flag carriers, or alternatively, if not, what do you think government has to do there? I think there's been this very clear recognition that the aviation industry can't really continue on the track that it's currently going. Uh, people are very sceptical of the need for the volume of flights that, you know, were taking place before COVID-19. And I'm just interested in picking a little bit less about the detail, but more your sort of conceptual view of what the aviation industry should end up being. Um, yeah, that's a that's a um, a good question. I have to be very careful what I say because um, you know commitments on future policy and particularly um, announcements of new nationalisations are definitely way above my pay grade, and I don't want to be sacked before I finish my important work um, on the finance bill. Though that would be an excellent get out of jail free card from the rest of the um, scrutiny we've got uh, lying ahead in the coming weeks. Um, 
I think the aviation industry is an in, or actually just actually a quick step backwards on, on transport yeah. policy, first of all. Um, I, I thought actually, to be fair to them, um, the, the, the previous leadership um, and the sort of, you know, whether it's sort of Jeremy Corbyn raising buses at Prime Minister's questions, which he was massively derided for by braying Tories and some sections of the media, but had incredible cut through because, you know, it turns out to the surprise of precisely no one who is normal, that lots of people use buses and rely on buses and the bus, buses are an important part of the transport network. You know, whether it is on, on the, the, the sort of the priority that was given to buses or, um, you know, challenging some of, um, you know, the, the sort of backward thinking on, on railways, I thought that transport was one area where, we, I mean, we never quite nailed it. And I don't think... Um, Labour ever quite captured the public mood on transport or provided um, answers in a way that got people thinking, yeah, this is you know great, I'm going to vote Labour because they're going to sort out my sort of transport issues. But I do think we were moving in, it actually more in the right direction on that. Um, and and, and the, um, the derision I, I thought was very unfair. Um, uh, but uh, on aviation, I, I mean, I think we're, you know, aviation is just a, a particular sector at the moment, which is, um, you know, sort of literally grounded by this crisis. And, you know, with the aviation industry uh, comes 32 billion, sorry, 22 billion pounds uh, a year contribution to our economy. Uh, I think it's about 230,000 jobs um, in the industry and the manufacturing supply chain. In fact, if you take into account all of the other jobs that um, in some way, sort of, you know, are dependent on aviation, you know, you're looking at sort of half a million jobs. So it's an important industry. Um, one of the things I was trying to address this week um, in the urgent question in Parliament uh, and, and, given, and given acknowledgement to is, is kind of the tension between the aviation industry and the climate change agenda. Mm -hmm. Clearly the industry needs to change. They know that. Um, whether or not they're going to do it fast enough and you know whether they need a bit more compulsion is another matter but I think they understand it needs to change um, but aviation is a really good example where we should be looking at a just transition um, and sort of how we make sure that the transition towards a net zero economy um, is one that doesn't leave workers behind and communities um, devastated by, by sort of the job losses and, and dislocation um, and, and aviation will continue to play and, you know, look, look at in, investment in R&D and, you know, the, the, the way in which the industry itself changes. Um, and the government just had no answers on any of this stuff. And, and you know, there's a crisis on right now, huge industry, and the Chancellor still hasn't come up with any uh, sector specific measures, even though he was talking about this back in March. So um, really serious and critical. And that, that's where sort of Labour's been trying to keep the pressure up on the government, exposing some of their weaknesses. And speaking for huge numbers of people whose jobs are tied up, I mean, I've had I've had an incredible reaction in the last couple of days from British Airways workers and other people who work in in the industry um, who have been watching Parliament this week. Who wouldn't normally be watching Parliament, but you know they they, they know that what's happening in politics can have a direct impact on their jobs. Um, but you know, I, I think tying into um, sort of the broader question about sort of where we sort of where this goes. Um, you know, this is where our sort of policies that we come up with have to speak directly to people's experiences and people's priorities and how it would practically improve their lives and also explain how the Labour Party looking to the future is going to help navigate our country through um, some broader developments that have the potential to be quite exciting like the technological revolution we're living through but are also going to bring some big challenges and i think you know one of the big words i think labor should focus on in the next um, in the next few years and up to the election is security providing people with a sense of security about their own lives and um, the security of knowing that you know we're going to make sure they've got a decent job the security of having a home um, they can call their own which is safe and secure and affordable um, the security of knowing that um, their children are going to go to school and have opportunities um, and you know prospects for for a good life you know th these are sort of you know this isn't this isn't kind of rocket science stuff this is the basic stuff that all of us as human beings i think value um, and we've got to have some some policies that that speak to that that give people a practical sense of how labor will change the country and also a bit of security when people see this kind of turbulence in the world and the way in which you know change is going to become probably you know more seismic and more more rapid, giving them a sense that Labour is a party that will offer them security as well as opportunity. 
Yeah, I mean, it seems then the the obvious point to then make next is there seems to be a few things which we would have to balance together. And this is in conjunction with a question and answer session, which is uh, if one of the central issues Labour face at the next election is persuading the public that we could be credible in our handling of the economy, how do you envisage marrying that with convincing them of the high spending policies that would likely be needed to pursue a Green New Deal. And I want to just throw in a little bit to link it a bit better to the previous question is always how do we compete with those different agendas of security, uh, the Green New Deal, and in terms of being seen as responsible? What do you think is a little bit of the interplay between those three? Yeah, I think we've got to keep, we've got to keep an eye on sort of public attitudes um, on, on, on tax and spending and um, sort of think about how we influence their attitudes to those issues and also their attitudes to us in relation to those issues. So I do think one of the um, risks for the Labour Party at the moment is um, looking at the decisions that a Conservative Chancellor is making during a crisis situation and assuming that because the public have supported massive um, state intervention and unprecedented levels of spending in peacetime from a Conservative Chancellor to respond to an immediate crisis that when it comes to the next election people say oh in that case um, you know Labour Party is you know all fine to, to, to govern because um, we've just agreed to all of that spending over there from those guys. I think there's a sort of a, a perverse irony in a way in, um, in the same way that you know there's that kind of saying only Nixon could go to China. I think there is there is an extent to which the Tories just um, have a bit more credibility with the public on the decisions that Rishi Sunak's been taking because frankly the, the public know that the Tories don't like doing what they're doing and they're doing it because they have to whereas the public fear that we like spending money willy-nilly and we're not that bothered about whether it offers any real value or impact um, so you know part as I say this is partly about making sure the public see that we are making choices um, that we've got clear priorities and that we're, we're, we're talking about how you know things will, will, will impact um, and there is also a job to do um, in terms of sort of economic literacy as well um, because you know I think one of the things that the Tory and the language that we're using in the debate because I think one of the things the Tories have effectively done over the last decade and, and more just you know particularly the way they clobbered the last Labour government during the financial crisis is they were, they were very good at comparing um, government um, spending to a household budget and you know so this sense of you know or oh, running up the nation's credit card and all the rest of it in a way that just doesn't make you know any any real sense um, if you look at how government finances work but people buy it um, so I think we're gonna have to distinguish really carefully between um, the spending commitments we make to invest in infrastructure where we can show there'll be a longer term return on investment and why we're why we're making certain choices and decisions and the day-to-day. -day. Uh, I mean, I, I wrote quite a bit of this in the pamphlet. Um, I, I think um, of, of all of the stuff in my pamphlet that, you know, because the, the, the COVID crisis was beginning, you know, the scale of it became clear just as the pamphlet was going to press irritatingly. So I managed to get some references to coronavirus in and, and, and couching it in terms of its timeliness. Um, I, I think the one, the, one, the one bit that I'll probably have to go back and revisit most is some of the stuff around fiscal policy and fiscal rules. Um, but, but, you know, happily, um, you know, this is Bridget Phillipson's job in the Treasury team more than mine. So I shall pass my work on to her um, as helpful suggestions and, and it will be up to Bridget to, to sort of lead for us on that. Yeah, I mean, we won't, we won't press you too much further on that particular point. I am interested, though, because... You'll remember, I think it might have just, just before you came into Parliament in 2015, there was a lot of buzz around the Green Investment Bank. And then only three years later, the whole thing was privatised. Uh, uh, do you think that you could see, uh, do you think you could see any government in Britain, regardless Labour or Conservative, sort of revisiting that? Sort of COVID-19 has made us so much more aware that we do need to rely on state investment in research and development. I don't think that's a particularly controversial claim, but we don't seem to have any vehicle for that. Do you think, do you think it's more likely that the investment will come up in some other ways or do you, do you see, still see legs in the idea of a green? No, I, I think there are still um, legs, in the, legs in the idea. And you know, one of the things I was challenging 
um, ministers on today, although, you know, in a tangential way, because I would have got um, told off if I talked um, at greater length about the, the, the broader response to the climate emergency. But um, I think this whole, whole issue of sort of, you know, green finance is a really important one. Um, and, you know, I think there are um, lots of interesting uh, uh, outfits out there already that are looking at the whole area of green finance, particularly on the sort of social enterprise side of things as well. I mean, I think we've got to think about how we mobilise the resources of the state and the private sector and the voluntary sector to tackle this big existential threat. And this is kind of all encompassing. But I, I do think it requires really strong leadership from government. Um, I, I hope that um, all of those cynics and naysayers that would you know, that the wish the wish the state was, um, you know, very as small as possible and had little to do with people's lives. I think the, the I think that argument has um, been found you know, somewhat wanting by the current crisis. Um, and hopefully, lots of those businesses out there that um, you know introduce governments um, will recognise that they really do need the state as the insurer of last resort, if nothing else. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I think that, uh, you know, whichever way you look at it, both in sort of policy leadership terms, but also financing, the state has a really big and important role to play. Um, I'd like to see the Treasury playing a much bigger role in all of this, partly because, you know, one of my observations about government at the moment is I, I don't see any sort of strong leadership overall on climate change within the government. You've obviously got, you know, Bays and, you know, bits of DEFRA. I mean, really, as I sort of argued in, in the um, chapter on the climate emergency in my pamphlet, uh, I, I really think this needs strong action from Number 10 and or the Treasury. And one of the advantages of the Treasury is that it's got long tentacles into every government department and, you know, it has therefore a lot of clout um, and sway over the, the policy agenda within every government department. And also, as I argued today, through the tax system as well, through um, either incentivizing good behavior through the tax system or um, disincentivizing bad behavior through punitive uh, tax measures. Um, there, are, there are things that the Treasury can do to change the behavior of government, of corporations and, and wider societal change too. So I think the Treasury has got a particularly important role to play. And that's why one of the reasons I was you know, over the moon to get this particular job in the Treasury team um, is because I, I, I hold responsibility for climate change policy within the Treasury team. Um, and I know it's something that Annalisa as Shadow Chancellor is very passionate about too. Um, and, and I hope that um, in opposition, we can do things better than government in terms of our coordination across different teams. I'm already talking to Matt Pennycook, who's our Shadow Climate Change Minister. Um, Ed Miliband's commitment to this agenda is very well known. You've got Luke Pollard over in, in DEFRA, um, who, who wants to do more, more on environment and biodiversity and sustainability in that brief. So hopefully we, we can build between us a more coherent um, uh, agenda. And, and you know, I, I'd say credit where it's due as well. I do think on, on the sort of the climate change agenda, um, we are building on a lot of good work that's been handed over. Um, I, I'm sure I'm not the only one who was highly bemused by the reports that the Chancellor is considering um, adopting a green, uh, championing a green industrial revolution. Um, uh, I'm sure the Shadow Education Secretary will be willing to give him some homeschooling um, if he wants some tips and ideas about how to do that. Um, uh, but, you know, uh, my fear is that it's a bit like the national living wage. You know, the, the, the minimum wage was introduced by a Labour government and the Tories fought it tooth and nail. Um, then we had, the, you know, a living wage movement and the Labour Party um, agreed to support the real living wage. And what did George Osborne do? Chucked up the minimum wage, called it a living wage. And now we've got this kind of contest about whose is the real living wage. Um, not much of a contest in my view, but the government does get to nick loads of the language. And, and my fear is that he's going to adopt um, the language of the Green Industrial Revolution, which I always thought was very smart framing, um, speaking to our own industrial heritage and history in the way that the Green New Deal speaks to the American heritage. Um, but my fear is that Rishi Sunak is going to um, nick um, Becky Long Bailey's language, um, but not the ambition and the policy agenda to go with it. Yeah, I think that's I think that's almost going to be a, a certainty now. I think there's this recognition that something has to be done on the issue, uh, but as is quite often the case, there's this, there's the the great difference 
quite often for me between conservative and labor policies is this formal approach versus this substantive approach really addressing the underlying causes on the labor side whilst really just addressing it with a surface level coat of paint uh, on the conservative side and it does lead me to think to ask the question you know i think it's really fantastic that we've finally started to get genuine coordination from people in different parts of the shadow cabinet at uh, talking about a cohesive joint strategy uh, what i'm interested in is what do you think we could be doing as labor activists in order to help shore up that conversation you know some people have talked about shareholder activism some people have talked about divestment what do you think is the best way that we as a labor movement can positively push towards uh this uh, green industrial revolution green new deal whatever language you wish to place on it electing a labor government um i i, 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 I think the, the green the green the green movement and you know, I know that they sometimes, you know, I think are in danger of creating a, um, a sort of an inverse reaction from the public to the one they want. But I do think Extinction Rebellion have broadly with, you know, occasionally they've got some stunts wrong and annoyed people and lost some support. But generally speaking, I think um, Extinction Rebellion did a great job in really putting climate change on the agenda by um, you know a load of really high high profile visible activism, and you know having been involved in different pre pressure groups in the in the past, having led a pressure group um, uh, and worked for pressure groups, I think they've got a really important role to play in terms of um, influencing public policy and actually um, changing societal attitudes. So I'm not knocking them. Um, our job is a different one in the Labour Party. Um, our job is to make sure that we have a Labour government that can enact policies and change. So that's not to say that Labour Party members shouldn't be engaged in broader activism. Um, in fact, I think we, we learn a lot from doing things outside the Labour Party that we can bring in with, you know, to the Labour Party as members. But, you know, the, the, you know in terms of things like divestment campaigns and things like that i, I kind of think that those, those sorts of things are things that the experts in the pressure group should be doing you know mobilizing people yeah. um to, to sort of divest or to change their behavior um you know we want to win power so that we can enact change through government um not simply to act as a pressure group and you know I, and that's an important point to make i think because you know there, there is there is a risk that despondency sets in and people look at the scale of the defeat of the last election and look at the size of the swing we need to win the next thing. Oh, this is a two term project at least, isn't it? All right, well, let's just try and apply some pressure and make the Tories less nasty waste of time. Um, and you know, if that's what we want to do, we may as well just pack up the Labour party and go and join some good pressure groups because they'd be very effective. Um, but I think a lot of those pressure groups are actually looking to us, um, to, to, to be able to en enact change and to make a real difference. And, um, you know, it's not a statement of party policy because um, it was written when I was a backbencher quite deliberately, but there are lots of ideas that I've put in the pamphlet that I think the next Labour government um, and the current opposition leadership might take a good look at. Yeah, I mean, the one thing that I'm a little bit worried about is some people within the Labour movement saying, well, is it really worth investing all our all of our time and all of our energy into an opposition party the the precise comparison that was given to me was well it seems to me that protests uh and sort of extra governmental energy uh at least on the face of it is seen as being more effective in soliciting that sort of change than governmental institutions have been or the institutions of opposition have been what would you say to someone who had that sort of uh approach um, you know, again, not knocking sort of wider activism. I do think there is a danger that when you're mixing heavily and repeatedly in political circles, whether that's our own constituency parties or, um, you know, sort of pressure groups and, and all the rest of it, We've always got to bear in mind that we are a self-selecting group. Yeah. 
And at the moment, although the Labour Party has got record levels of members, um, I think over 600,000 members now, which is just brilliant and phenomenal, um, it's still a minority sport. And there, we are still a tiny minority of the country's population. Um, we are choosing to spend our time in a different way to the vast majority of other people. And so, and this is something that I think political parties have to wrestle with a lot more than lots of pressure groups and, and in some ways, um, which is, you know, how do you, how do you marry your own values, your own ideas and your burning hunger to tackle um, the challenges that your political party wants, whether, you know, in our case, it's tackling poverty, inequality, injustice at home and around the world and how you redistribute power, wealth and opportunity. Um, you know, I'm, I'm sure conservatives might, might might have some burning passions and desires to to um, that motivate them to join politics, but they tend to their their passion and desire tends to be to make sure the government doesn't do much. Um, so I'm not sure that, how quite how that motivates you to, to to do what to do what we do in terms of knocking on doors in the rain and all the rest of it. But um, you know that that I think is the big difference, and, and we we you know just making sure that. You know, if you are one of those people that are swirling around lots of different political groups and, you know, weaving in and out of the Labour Party and other pressure groups and, and all the rest of it, you know, we've always got to bear in mind that, you know, we're talking to a very different group of people to most people. And, that, and that's why, you know, knocking on doors and people going out canvassing is really important. I saw one, one disillusioned member on social media the other week um, complaining, saying that, he thought canvassing was a waste of time he could because he found it a soul destroying experience because when he was knocking on doors for the last election he was being abused and people were having a go at him and saying labor was rubbish and he got the door slammed in his face loads well i mean firstly no one should be abused going out campaigning um that's not been my general experience and the experience of my constituency party members um but you know i think particularly around some of the brexit stuff things have become more febrile but there's no excuse for any of that really people shouldn't be behaving like that but I kind of, what I wanted to sort of say is that if that's your experience and you're going out knocking on doors and people are telling you they don't like your party very much, your responsibility as a member, I would argue, is as, is, is as great as mine, it's a, which is to go back and make sure that's heard by the party and think, well, what are we going to do to change it? Because for, for a long time, I've been in favour of more um, sort of member involvement in policy making and decision making. I used to, when I was involved in Labour students, have a pop at government ministers saying, you know, you want to use us as foot soldiers and go out and knocking on doors. But, you know, when it comes to policy, we're at loggerheads and you don't listen and engage properly. Um, uh, so I, I hope that, you know, that sense that the party has got to be more inclusive and democratic is one that um, we take forward in a meaningful way and improve party democracy. But with that, power that party members have in terms of party democracy comes a responsibility that's, that's the same as mine which is to make sure that our party is representative and listening and 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 taking the public with us and if we're not rethinking because there's no point being the the, the righteous loser in the corner um complaining about how much, much things how better things would be if your particular agenda was in government if that government happens to be a tory government and um a failure to listen to the public hands the Tories that result. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, what I will do now is I'll ask a few more of the questions from the q and I might come back in a, in a little bit. Uh, Alex Craven asks, what does our Clause 4 moment need to be in order to demonstrate that we are still a modernising force and relevant? Hmm. Yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, it's interesting because uh, I've been thinking about sort of Keir's early, um, you know, early weeks as leader and, and what he's been doing and um, the, the start he's gotten off to. And what I find really impressive about Keir's style of leadership, and I think it's a, um, a, a quality that was directly linked to that huge mandate that he got from the membership and, and how he won the leadership election. He's managed to bring about change and to start moving the party in the right direction in a really effective, um, really professional um, way without there being a load of blood on the carpet. So we, we've seen 
changes in senior personnel. We've seen um, changes in um, the approach to disciplinary cases. I think a sort of commitment to tackling anti-Semitism that's not just been reflected in noble words, but have now being followed through in action. Um, and I'm really impressed by that, actually. I mean, in the, in the pamphlet, one of the things I said was that the next leader of the Labour Party has to hit the reset button and to do so boldly and loudly enough that the public take notice. I think the public have noticed that Keir um, is, a, is a different leader and that we've got a new leader and it's someone that they, I think they're increasingly, the more they're seeing of him, they have more confidence in him and his response to the crisis. I think he hasn't put a foot wrong, unlike the Prime Minister. And when people are now asked to compare Keir Starmer and Boris Johnson, that comparison is very favourable for Keir. And he's outperforming the Labour Party in the polls, which is where you want a leader to be. Um, I do think collectively we are going to have to show the country that we've changed. And for me, that's about um, getting the political culture of our party right, um, making it a more welcoming and inclusive space. And there's a shared responsibility there for all of us. And, you know, beyond the sort of the egregious examples of racism and bullying where, you know, frankly, if you're a perpetrator um, or you're an, an, a bystander or enabler, you know, you're not, not really welcome in the party. I think actually there are lots of people with, you know, coming from very different left wing traditions in the Labour Party, um, where, you know, in the, in, in the last sort of five years or so, I, I don't think we've modelled particularly good um, behaviours about how to engage with each other, debate with each other, listen to each other, learn from each other. And, you know, I say that with a huge amount of personal self-reflection and humility too, you know, um, I think about those members that joined in the aftermath of Jeremy Corbyn's first leadership election victory. And, um, you know, they, uh, I think there was, there were all sorts of comments about sort of three pound trots and entryists and all the rest of it. And although, you know, there were some people who on social media were boasting that they were um, Trotskyists and entryists. Um, I, I just think we did a huge disservice actually to a whole load of people who were joining the Labour Party because they genuinely wanted to make things better and, um, we had a leader who spoke to them and inspired them to join. And uh, I think social media is a big part of this problem, by the way, because at no point in the last five years would I, as, a, as, a mem as an MP in my own constituency party meeting, have a new member walk through the door and say, who are you are? What are you doing here? Are you one of those three pound trots? And if you are, bugger off. Um, you know, my CLP, we're actually very welcoming. We're very inclusive. Um, we try and involve people, we try and listen respectfully where we disagree. My EC um, executive committee has got people on it who voted for Jeremy, people who voted for Liz Kendall and sort of, you know, uh, Yvette and Andy and every, every, you've got all the Labour Party reflected around the table. Um, and that's the way it should be. And um, we don't have to agree all, all the time and that's all right. Um, but I think we have to um, disagree without being disagreeable. and and maybe just start listening to each other again. Because I think sometimes we assume the worst motivations about each other as well. Sometimes I read character characterizations and caricatures of my own sort of politics and policy positions on um, Twitter. And just think, I, I just, I don't recognize this person. Those aren't my political views. Um, but, you know, uh, I have to own some of that and think about how, we, how you know, I'm, I'm modeling the right behaviors as well and helping to change the culture of the party. Yeah, but also a reminder to everyone that maybe not spend too much time on Twitter. Oh, God. I mean, I'll tell you what, my, my life has become immeasurably better since I dramatically changed my notification settings and spent less time on there. Um, it's, uh, it, it, it's, it's not what it was. And do you think there's a little bit of that? I mean, I ask it a slightly more of, uh, in a slightly more informal way. Do you think there's a little bit of that that as Labour activists and as members of the Labour movement, we do get a little bit too sweeped up in the whole... Twitter sphere. Do you think that we often suffer from our own noise and it and do you think that does disconnect us from voters and what they actually think? In, enormously, enormously. Um, and there, there is just no substitute in my books for knocking on doors and talking to people and asking them what, what's bothering them. Um, most members of the public, if we're lucky, tune in for a few seconds each day to the broadcast media and hear something from the Labour Party. 
and, and actually the challenge for the Labour Party is to try and capture their attention for those few seconds each day and to get across a message that makes them think, oh, there we are, that was good. Um, it might be a fleeting glance. Um, and the way in which media is changing, and we, we, sh we should and could and are doing more through social media, but, you know, broadcasters still matter, the print media still um, helps to shape the agenda, and, you know, that no substitute for going out and, and engaging with people and talking to people locally. Um, but yeah, always, you know, always got to keep in mind that Twitter is a self, you know, it is, it is, a, it is an echo chamber and a bubble. And, um, you know, and I, I don't think it, uh, I, I, every, at least once a month, I think maybe I should just delete my Twitter account and move on. Um, but I always feel like if I do, I'll somehow be missing out or that all the wrong people will be cheering and think, good, he's gone. We finally got rid of him. No, I think that might well be the case. Uh, but, yeah, I just wanted to clear up that, you know, it's, you know, Twitter is a useful tool. I don't know how much casework you'd actually get through something like Twitter, though. Oh, hardly any. And in fact, um, I mean, I use my social media channels in very different ways. So um, uh, Twitter is um, largely for sort of broadcasting opinions and sort of short, sharp reactions to things. And... Um, knowing, and I always think of Twitter as I'm talking to the Westminster Village, I'm talking to yeah. you know, the journalists, I'm talking to other MPs and think tanks and people who kind of pay close attention to things we tweet uh, and political activists who, who um, inhabit Twitter. My Facebook page is much more focused on my constituents. I've, I, I put far more constituency focused content there. Um, I target advertising and posts to the reach of my constituency more than anything else. Um, and that's that's a really important channel, especially at the moment, really important channel for me to try and reach people. And I find that um, the people on it, the way they speak um, and engage with other people and the way they engage with me feels much closer, not identical to, but much closer to the doorstep than, than Twitter. So I kind of use Facebook for that. My Instagram, I keep very, very personal. I put some political content and some personal stuff on there. Um, but it's mainly sort of, you know, pictures of um, what I've done at the weekend or you know, what, what I've managed to bake in the oven or something like that. So not very exciting, but you know, that's my kind of, I, I think of Instagram as the nice space where there are nice things and nice people. And, um, you know, you very rarely get trolling on Instagram and, and usually I'm quite, I don't, I don't tend to block people, but on Instagram, you know, if you're trolling my Instagram, you're, you're straight out, go back to Twitter. <laughs> Wonderful. Uh, I will say there are two questions which have, quite similar aims them. So Ian uh, makes a point about the beverage report having five giant ills in society. Uh, and apparently climate change should now be listed as one of those, which I completely agree with. Uh, he asks what big, what structural change, not as like a policy or anything, what big thing do you think needs to change structurally over the period of the next two or three parliaments so that we can meet uh, our ambitious commitments. Uh, that's in terms of creating green growth, jobs, opportunities. And Ajay also asks, what do you think are the low hanging fruit when it comes to the green recovery and job creation? Yeah, luckily, luckily I kind of glanced at Ian's question um, long before you asked it because um, I thought it was quite a challenging question actually. Um, to sort of the, the one thing, but, um, I guess when I was writing the pamphlet, one of the things that, you know, I will revisit as a topic and f feel increasingly more strongly about is about sort of where power sits and who exercises it and in whose interest. And I think in the past, I would have been quite cynical about that for a couple of reasons. One is, and this is, this is kind of heresy, especially for a Fabian Society Executive Committee members to say, um, as much as I'm in favour of constitutional reform, um, quite honestly, it is not the thing that sets my blood, you know, my pulse running faster and gets me excited. Um, I think it's important and I support, um, you know, progressive campaigns for electoral reform. And, you know, I think that this is, but that's one that constitutional reform is one of those issues where I look at my colleagues who really care about it and go, great, thanks for doing that for us. I'm right behind you, but you can do that. Um, and so partly I've kind of felt that some of that debate about sort of power and devolution sometimes feels quite abstract, whereas I'm much more about 
sort of you know social policy education welfare um you know the, the sort of things that affect people's day-to-day -day life and and their sort of you know economic injustice i guess is the thing that i'm most you know sort of passionate about um and the second thing is um i think the labor party has gone through a journey and i've i've gone through a sort of a, a sort of a long period of sort of thinking about this and and shaped by my experience in local government the Labour Party can be quite a statist and quite centralising political party and certainly when you're in the Treasury or and in the Treasury team uh, there's definitely a culture in in the Treasury um, uh, that you know power is best held centrally and even within central government it's held even more centrally in the Treasury and you can pull policy levers and get stuff done and you need that kind of centralised power of the state in order to to affect meaningful change in a fair and consistent way um, and I, I, I think that you do need um, a strong strategic smart state nationally um, that's able to ensure um, you know beyond obvious things that should be done nationally like sort of defense and security and those sorts of things you know is able to um, ensure that revenues are collected and public spending is allocated in a fair way so that you don't just see the richest regions becoming richer than the poor, poor are left behind, which is what we've seen with some aspects of Tory local government finance um, reform. Um, but more and more, I just think it cannot be a coincidence that this country is not just one of the most unequal in terms of the gap between the richest and the poorest, but when you look at the regional inequality, you know, this, our country is home to nine of the 10 poorest regions in Western Europe and also um, the richest in inner London. And I think that we've got to do two things. One is to devolve more power and responsibility and resources from central government to local government. Uh, but I also think we've got to um, think about how we put more hands genuinely in the hands of people. And, and one of the things I talk about in the pamphlet is um, Hilary Cotton's work and her book Radical Help, um, which works with some of the most marginalised people, um, you know, on the real hard end of inequality and injustice, who often feel like they're victims of the state rather than helped by it. And she says, well, why are we, you know, we're spending huge amounts of money to try and tackle some of these problems and so-called troubled families. And when you get all of the agencies in the room that they agree with, this is army of professionals, but none of them talk to each other. And they're all telling families what they ought to be doing when actually what we should be doing is sitting down with people and saying, you know, uh, how does your life need to change? And what do you, what, what barriers do we need to knock down in order to help you to do that? So you give people more, power and agency and control over their own lives and she, she gives some really concrete practical examples of how you do that but it is in public policy terms that can be quite messy and you know we like um particularly in the treasury you know they like um you know formula and um tick boxes and you know you've got to fit into particular boxes and life and people just often aren't like that um, and I think there have been, um, you know, the Social Exclusion Unit under the last Labour government did some remarkable work in this area, but I think we can go further. So that, that one big paradigm shift, I would say, is, is, is giving power away, sort of decentralising it, not just from one layer of government to another, from central to local government, but also um, thinking about how you give people more power, agency and control over their own lives. Um, on the, uh, finally, just on the, um, on, on the green side of things, I mean, I think there is some, I think it's quite a bit of low hanging fruit I mean, in the um, chapter on, you know, climate change. Um, I, I, I do think that there are, um, you know, I mean, the, Mark Carney's leadership when he was governor of the Bank of England, I thought was, was really quite something um, and has had a, a sort of a, a global reach in terms of his leadership on how um, financial services uh, need to rethink their approach to um, and their responsibilities in relation to climate change and, and some of the risks. Uh, and, and that just reminds us that the UK is respected, that it does have clout in the world and that we can make a real difference. So I think, um, you know, stronger leadership from the top, um, nationally enforced targets um, that we can all be held to account to, um, and, you know, some regulatory independence and the way that we've got an office for budget responsibility. I think having, having some, some, some arm's length agencies with some teeth to hold governments to account to deliver um, on our net zero ambitions. Um, 
you know, I, I think there are, there are lots of things that we can do that are quick wins, whilst also picking up Greta Thunberg's challenge, which is, you know, scrambling over the next five years to do the things we know need to be done, while also thinking a bit more longer term about some of the things that we, we, we get, have a sense need to be done, but we haven't quite figured out how to do it yet. Yeah, perfect. So there are two more questions. Uh, you mentioned divestment. What do you think is the role of higher education in divestment? And do you think uh, government uh, has a responsibility to act on the divestment message if private institutions refuse to do so? Yeah, that's a that's a, a kind of um, kind of taking me back now to some of the work that I used to do when I was in student politics. Um, and I was very proud to see actually that um, at my old university, um, student union pressure had led to divestment from fossil fuel funds from in terms of um, the investments of the university. Um, I mean, that, that's why, you know, earlier I was very keen not to knock pressure groups and that kind of activism. And, you know, people bash student politics quite a lot um, and say, oh, you know, um, people are playing student politics. I mean, I have to say now, having done so-called grown-up politics in Parliament, one of the things that strikes me is that um, there are a lot of the same people kicking around and um, the sort of the people who haven't come through student politics um, exhibit all the same behaviours that I saw in student politics. So um, I think I think people are often just sort of moaning about politics, really. Um, I, I thought student politics was really good because it was a way of actually being able to affect change. Um, to the student experience and to um, sort of mobilise students to to affect positive societal change, um, and you know did all sorts of activism and campaigning from really domestic student focused stuff like that, um, right through to um, internationalism and and kind of global campaigns around sort of Darfur and um, you know some of the other big global issues at the time around um, Jubilee the Jubilee debt campaigns and stuff that I did when I was at school. So then that's all really important. Um, I, I think in, in, in sort of public policy terms, I think we've got to try and create the framework to sort of help people make better choices and judgments and to move in the right direction. Um, in my job, my sort of treasury team job, for example, um, you know, as well as having responsibility for sort of climate change policy within the treasury team, um, I also have responsibility for oil and gas. And I did not expect that when I would have my first conversation with the oil and gas industry, that one of the first things that they wanted to talk about was climate change and just transition. And of course, I'm sure, you know, to a certain extent, some of that is corporate PR and, um, you know, smart positioning. They're not naive or stupid, but there is also a, a genuine, you know, they know that they know that their, their industry has got a, a sort of a limited shelf life and, you know, but they are thinking about what it is that they know and um, the technology that they have and that they're developing uh, and, and its wider application and service. And that's why I think you can have some really interesting conversations on this agenda that you wouldn't expect. And you can speak, you can go into a room expecting people to be on the other side of the argument to find that actually they want to pull with you. And I think that's the, you know, that, that's, the, that's the space for political leadership really, is to sort of think about how do we pull the country together and so we're all pulling in the same direction because hitting that net zero target um, is going to be really challenging and the consequences of failing to do it are unthinkable. So, you know, we've got to do it and that requires stronger leadership from the top. Perfect. I mean, that's all the questions that I have for the moment. I believe uh, Cecilia has one question or a, a cluster of questions that she'll want to uh, ask you. Uh, but in terms of my portion of it, uh, thank you ever so much for doing the Q&A with us. Not at all. Not quite a cluster, but definitely one. Also, I definitely echo what you said about student politics, can uh, emphasize, empathize there. Um, so touching on that key portfolio in terms of the economics of climate change, we're really glad you got it. Um, so I'm also on the Environment Committee for the Young Fabians and wanted to pick your brains. Um, the UN Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change recently stated that humanity has 11 years left to avoid the worst effects of global warming. So picking up on what you said earlier, at the moment we're about to host an event in response to the National Policy Forum call out for questions. 
And I was wondering in terms of your brief and perspective, what environmental conditions should be attached to taxpayer funded government support for businesses during and after the pandemic? Yeah, uh, and this is this is an area where Annalise Dodds has been um, trying to get the government to think, um, you know, sort of not even, it's not, you don't even need to think very creatively. I think it is just so blindingly obvious that if you're handing over significant sums of taxpayer money, um, that you can attach some reasonable conditions to it. Um, you know, in term, you know, it could be as simple as, um, you know, clear it clear and binding environmental action plans and you know you, you can you can do that kind of sector by sector so, and government will have been having conversations with um with these industries and indeed individual companies um for some time so where you know that there's a reluctance to change attach a condition to it and you know we've been finding in our engagement um with a whole range of sectors and industries that when we've been making this argument and making this case um the you know they've been up for it so the airlines for example um you know we need them to be a lot more ambitious in terms of um, reducing their carbon footprint and their impact on climate change and you know when you when we've said to them well look you know we let, we think that you know we, we we think there needs to be a sector deal and we're willing to advocate for a bailout but you you'd have to accept some environmental commitments that go alongside it and some strings attached um, people are up for it um, they understand um, that that would be the case and I and the, you know, I just think it's a real failure of imagination on the part of the government that they're not signing up to that um, you know that what it is that we ask for I think will, will depend from sector to sector but um, you know I, I'm just absolutely exasperated by the lack of ambition and I'll tell you what you know I know I talked about this just before everyone came in earlier but like that urgent question the other day where you had Tory after Tory standing up talking about BA saying oh they've taken this government money but now they're talking about making their staff redundant like no shit Sherlock we t this is exactly what we've been warning you about for weeks and weeks and weeks we told you this would happen we said protect jobs and livelihoods um, and attaching conditions around work, workers' rights and, and employment. And they just didn't listen. And, it, you know, you always, you always hope people will do the right thing, but sometimes you need a bit of a stick um, to go alongside the carrot. And I think um, that's where the, I think the Treasury has, has got it quite... I think they've had a real missed opportunity, actually. I mean, there's a broader debate as well about, which ties into some of the, um, some of the challenges we've got in British business around long-termism. Um, and the inherent short termism of some of the boardroom thinking where, um, you know, where, the, where, where a serious bailout is required and we're handing over vast sums, government might want to think about taking a stake in some of those um, industries where then you could have, um, you know, more shareholder activism from government and, you know, more of a sway over um, decisions taken in the boardroom. That's not without risks, by the way. Um, and I think sometimes, um, you know, people leap to assume that, the government having a stake in a particular business or industry would be you know only have positives for the government and no challenges or negatives um that's not always the case and i can i can think of a few big companies um in some of our big industries who would love to have government having some kind of um culpability in some of the longer term challenges facing their business um and a bit of political exposure as well. So we've got to be a bit careful around that, but I think we can, we can afford to be and, and should necessarily be more ambitious in terms of thinking about how we can um, use um, you know, conditions attached to government bailouts to affect the kind of change that we want to see. Definitely. And I suppose, as you said, got to hope that people will do the right thing and that the you know everyone you've been talking to in the oil and gas industry is not just kind of pivoting to greenwashing and kind of going about business as usual whilst projecting these ecologically and environmentally responsible images um, but that's everything for me so thank you i wanted to thank you again so much for coming providing such eloquent and great answers uh, to everyone and wanted to, yeah, uh, just hand over to Reda to wrap up now that we're at uh, 8.27.
Cool. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I have very little to follow up with that. It's just a, a genuine thanks for taking the questions that uh, everyone had asked. And really just in terms of a messaging wrapper, because of course this was a little bit of a, a webinar about action and strategy, is that uh, it was really the, the very last question that I asked that I really hope people take up on. Uh, just because we're out of government doesn't mean that we can't have very real and very substantive steps that we could take to one, get back there, and two, do the right thing when we get there. Yeah, uh, and that's I, absolutely right. Absolutely and right. I, and I think Wes is really, you know, using an hour and a half of his time, really encapsulates that sort of enthusiasm and that genuine belief. So genuinely, just thank you for sharing that with us. And hopefully we can all derive some lessons from that uh, and be sort of better activists when talking. No, th thanks. Well, and, and thanks for having me along. Um, I mean, I think young Fabians, are, I think we're ahead of the game in terms of setting up these kinds of Zoom events. And now we're all kind of getting used to them and getting Zoom-eyed. But... Um, young Fabian saw an opportunity, um, you know, there, and and clearly th there's demand for it. But um, I, be, I, I mean, I've been, I mean, I did an event with party members last night in North Warwickshire. I mean, amid all this kind of misery, there there is something that's positive that's come out, which is making it easier to connect with party members across the country, making sure that we're taking events outside of Westminster so it's not just people who live in London um, and can commute in in the evening to, to, to an event in Parliament that can participate. We want to do much more of this. And, um, and I think in the context of some of the cultural challenges we talked about in terms of the party, the more and more we have um, discussion, engagement, interaction, the better. And, you know, um, Celia's, um, you know, talk there about um you know i guess for looking looking to me for some, was it pearls of wisdom i think you said but i think it's also fair to say that um believe it or not labor mps don't know it all and um uh, we're not supposed to let let on too much but you know you, you there's a huge amount of expertise out there in our membership as well um and whether that's through you you know academically or through your professional lives or just your wider interests um, and lives there's there's lots for us to learn as well so um, it's nice to have these sorts of in, in, interactive events as well so feel free to keep in touch with me um, if any of you ever want to be in touch with me about any of the policy issues I'm responsible for feel free to drop me an email if ever you want me to come speak to local groups either virtually or in person I, I'm really really happy to do that and I'm sure that applies to um, MPs right across the parliamentary party as well and and also reflecting um, just on on your concluding point there Edda, about um, you know, sort of the role of the Labour Party. Labour is in government already in Wales and um, across cities and towns and communities in England as well. I hope we'll, we'll gain more power in next year's elections. Um, but um, yeah, really keen to, to engage where we're already in power too. But thanks very much for having me. I've really, really enjoyed it. Perfect. Thank you, everyone, and to all the attendees, to Wes, to Cecilia. Uh, have a lovely evening. You too. Thanks a lot. Take care, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye.